Jesus will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we say glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We say glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When the enemy presses in hard, do not fear. Good morning, Signal Mountain. It's always good for God's people to be together. Amen. Thank you. I want to welcome everyone here that's here in the, in the auditorium in the Fellowship Hall watching online. Uh, and if you're our visitor, you're our very special guest. We appreciate you joining with the, uh, the family of God that meets here at Signal Mountain. Uh, as we open our worship this morning, I want to offer a prayer and then we'll resume the singing and our worship. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, our God, our King, our Creator, we thank, you for, we thank you for the privilege to be together as your sons and daughters. We thank you for redeeming us out of the world. We thank you for paying our debt so that we can be uh, in your presence. We thank you for declaring us holy through the blood of Jesus in spite of our shortcomings and our failings. We know, Lord, you are the creator of all things, you see the end from the beginning, you span time and you know all things. We are, we are honored to be in your presence. We thank you for, for the reason that we're here today is our resurrected Messiah, Jesus Christ, and we pray through his name. Amen. First song this morning will be 797. All three verses. Onward, rejoicing, I tread life's way. Higher I'm climbing each passing day. Hilltops of glory now rise in view. Where all shall be made new. Hilltops of glory I have. Seven hundred ninety, seven nine zero. 
Let's sing it like we believe it. This is one of my favorites. Let's sing it loud. Sing the wondrous Psalm for our communion to be 458. 458. sure who's supposed to be doing this this morning but let's go ahead and open up to book of Luke chapter 22 as humans 
we tend to like grand things. We like to make th blow things up. We like to make things bigger, more exciting, more spectacular. And yet in Luke 22, beginning in verse 14, we read, When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. He said to them, With fervent desire, I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat it, eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this, divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table, and truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. By all rights, this, this time should be a magnificent, huge event. I mean, we're celebrating the salvation that comes to the entire world. We're mourning the death of the Son of God. And yet what Jesus set, set up, what Jesus put before us, is something very simple. Something very mundane. Something that, that should, be, should become just a part of our life at all times. Something that should just be, just, should just be there rather than this great, magnificent event. It, it sometimes stupefies me the way the Lord does things, but He does it with a purpose that, that we can come together on a regular basis and just remember Him. Just simply come before Him. A piece of bread, a small cup of fruit of the vine to remember the greatest event this world has ever seen. Let us go before our God in prayer. Holy Father, as we come before you this morning, we, we humble ourselves. We recognize our sin. Our sin that demanded a death. Our sin that separated us from you. Our sin that was paid, paid for by the body of Christ. Lord, we come before you and we thank you for that. We offer our simple thanks. As we remember the debt paid. As we remember the body broken. Lord, thank you so much for that sacrifice. We pray your blessing upon us as we eat. May we always, always partake of it in a worthy manner. Lord, we ask this, we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us continue in prayer. Father God, as we come before you once again this morning, we remember the, the innocent blood of the Lamb. We remember our helplessness, lost in our sin, our inability to, to do anything about it, our inability to come before you clean, washed, our inability to reach out to you on our own. And yet you freely offered. the blood, the blood of the Holy One.
to wash us and make us whole. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for the cleansing power of the blood. We thank you that, that you have called us, called us to yourself and bought us with the blood. You paid the price. Lord, we pray your blessing upon us as we partake. Pray that we might always do so in a manner that is pleasing to you. Lord, we ask as we pray this in the name of our beloved Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. say a prayer for the offering. I'm going to be briefly read from Luke chapter 21. Beginning in verse 1. Luke 21 verse 1. And Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he also saw a certain poor widow putting in two mites. He said, truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all of these, out of their abundance, have put in offerings for God, but she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, as we come before you this morning, we we look at the examples that you have put in Scripture for us. Examples of how to live, examples of how to treat each other, examples of how to serve you, examples of how to live righteously, how to love. And as we look at this example, this poor widow, Lord, I pray that we have the same heart that she did. A heart that wants to give all to you. A heart that, that doesn't just give what little leftover time and resources we have, but Lord just once just gives all to you. Gives to your glory. Gives to serving you in this world. Lord, help us to do better, to have the right heart, to have the strength, and the courage. Lord, we ask this, we pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. We'll go ahead and mark the song of imitation is 703, 703. And the song before our scripture reading our lesson this morning will be 854. And if you will, please stand and remain standing for the scripture reading.
This morning's scripture reading will be taken from Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in, because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the uh, tilling into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said to them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and all of our many blessings, and thank you for allowing us another opportunity to come together this morning to worship you and hear another message from your word. And as we now prepare to hear the message, please help us open our hearts and minds and be receptive and apply it to our lives. Father, I especially want to thank you for allowing Greg to have a a safe trip recently to Central America and um, uh, be with the Christians there and just bless all the Christians around the world today, Father. Um, And we thank you for your son, Jesus. For without him, uh, we would have no hope of being saved. And we ask all this in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Signal Mountain. Welcome to all, and if you're online in the parking lot or in the fellowship hall or here in the auditorium, God bless you for being here. It's good to be together. First, I want to thank Kendall for his lesson last Sunday. I saw it online uh, and really appreciate that message. And if you missed it, go see it. It's still there online. And second, I want to share a little bit about my trip to uh, El Salvador with Hector in Guatemala. We went to El Salvador and Guatemala. Uh, We left Monday, October 25th and spent three days in a taco where the church is doing well, I'm so thankful. Uh, We traveled across Guatemala with a van load of youth and adults to a Christian conference where we spent three days and then we returned to the States on November the 2nd. Two main purposes for the trip was involved in this. Jerry Greeson, all of you who were here when Jerry was here with us, Jerry passed away, how long has it been now? Three years ago? Anyway, Jerry left a gift of $15,000 in support of, a, of Samuel uh, Valaforte's ministry uh, with the church at Itaco. And so we, as a congregation, have held that money and now it's been brought to be distributed for his support for the next two years. Samuel's a graduate from Baxter Institute, and this November 24th, he will be coming to Itaco to work full-time with that congregation that God has blessed us to be part of planting. Um, the second purpose of the trip was to go to the youth conference in Guatemala. So uh, we traveled to, when we first arrived, we traveled to Sonsonate the next day, purchased a motorcycle for Samuel to have transportation. And you say, why would you get a guy a motorcycle? Well, you got to go there and see what's going on. But he has no place to put a car at all. And so a motorcycle is the next best thing. And they can put about four people on those things, believe it or not. <clears throat> Uh, I was going to show you slides, but didn't have time, so I'll maybe let at another time. But on Wednesday, we went to visit several members of the family during the day, and then that evening we met with the Otako Church, and it was beautiful. The, the building looks good that we went down to build a few years ago, and also they've, they've got the inside is parged and painted, and the windows are nice, and doors look good, and uh, it was beautiful. Uh, and the, there's two buildings there, one across from the, the main one that the church meets in, uh, is going to be, Lord willing, used by Sunset School of Preaching to help do training for ministers in Central America, which would be a great thing, too, and it helps support them. 
Well, uh, Thursday, we uh, shopped for groceries, prepared for the whole church together, Ector's Place. We got chairs and tables and grills and whatnot. And that afternoon, before the presentation, we met with three of the leading men in the Church of Otako to discuss Samuel's coming and his support and their plans for this work and how the money's to be distributed to him and, uh, and how that was going to work out. And by 6 p.m., the place was crawling with people. And we, at 7, Hector translated for me to represent our congregation as I shared about Jerry's gift and Samuel's two years of support and his transportation, the motorcycle that was provided by several of the members of the congregation here. Uh, we had prayers together, and Samuel joined us on FaceTime for the presentation. And it was beautiful and encouraging. And I want you to know, I warned Samuel over and over, be careful with this machine, this bike. Don't get hurt on it. Just saying, I didn't have it as my notes, but I, when we got it back, I took it out to get some gas, came back with it, decided to take it for a little spin, and wrecked it, just so you know. It was very, very mild, thank the Lord. But it was just a head, tell Samuel, be careful with this machine. And Hector's dad had had two accidents. He'll never walk well again. Another preacher there in his 40s had had a motorcycle accident, went to sleep riding a motorcycle, broke both of his arms. Uh, I said, Samuel, we don't want to give this to you as a curse. We want it to be a blessing for you. So please, please, please be careful. Just saying. Uh, it was a beautiful and encouraging time to be together with the taco family there next morning five o'clock in the morning we left for the other side of guatemala past guatemala city antigua and so on went up in the mountains up and down and up and down as i said it was like a road it was like roberts mill on steroids up and down and uh i can show you pictures you wouldn't well you would believe but it was hard for me to believe and so from eight in the morning to 11 30 p.m we would gather for two days of spanish in preaching, praying, singing, panel discussions, and eating together. I found a couple of people who spoke English here and there. Hector was involved in the presentation, so I didn't have him to translate for me. But I tell you, by the end, I could almost follow what was said. And I was praying a lot. Lord, please help me understand this. And I, I'd find the Bible part, I could kind of, the words started connecting. It was really good. About 200 people gathered, had a baptism the first day. Boy's name, about 15-year-old named Christian. He became a Christian that day. It was beautiful. Uh, I didn't understand much, but what I saw and experienced was deeply encouraging. Monday, we traveled back to El Salvador. Tuesday, we returned home. And I could go on and on, but I want to share the Word of God with you today. So the third part of my presentation today is the sermon. Are you ready? Open your Bibles. Matthew chapter 9. We're going to look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account of this healing of this paralytic. And I want to walk you through the story a little bit. And let's see if we can't see ourselves and learn some things about ourselves as we hear God speak to us through his word. Matthew 9, real short piece in Matthew. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us about this. So let me just to set the, set the course before we read. There are 36 recorded miracles of Jesus in the Gospels. 18 of those are recorded in all three of the first Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record 18 of those. And all the miracles of Jesus had not only the effect of proving his authority as the Son of God, but in some cases they had specific application to specific aspects of his authority. And this miracle is one of those, a very important one. It occurs early in his ministry. And let's just, as we read through this account, notice Matthew's account is the most brief. Mark and Luke fill in details that reveal more about the miracle and more about its purpose. And as we read, ask yourself this. Ask yourself these questions. Number one, do I believe this really happened? Did people really see this? Number two, what does Jesus want to show us today through this miracle? Number three, what do I do with this information? What do I do with it? So Matthew chapter 9 begins our reading of the account that Matthew gives us. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. His own city. Hmm, where would that be? And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their hearts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? 
Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed and go home. And he arose and went home, and the crowd saw it. They were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given men such authority. Quite abbreviated version, isn't it? Now let's go to Luke, I mean Mark, Mark chapter 2. This is very early in Jesus' ministry, but he's already re gotten a reputation as one who can do things that for, are from God, powers from God. So, Mark 2, beginning verse 1. When he returned to Capernaum, oh, that's the city that Matthew didn't say. He returned to Capernaum after some days, and it was reported that he was at home. Evidently, he used that as his place of dwelling. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. He was preaching the word to them, and they came. They, who's they? They came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men, and when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof from above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they had thus questioned within themselves, he said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he arose immediately and picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Okay, Luke, the third witness to this event. Let's go back and read it again. I appreciate John reading that. I want to read it one more time. Get the impact. Let it sink in. Steep in these words, okay? Chapter 5, beginning verse 17, again. In one of those days, he was teaching. Doesn't say where, does it? Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. What a crowd. Luke tells you more about who was there. Mark tells you where they were. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Whoa. Luke mentions that. None of the others mention. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. Some men. Don't know how many in Luke. In Mark, we know it was four. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed, a little more detail there, through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he, Jesus, saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. Gives you that addition of what the man did after he was healed. And amazement seized them all. And they, were, they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. Let's pray. We've heard God's word. Let's pray. Holy Heavenly Father, your name and authority are over all things. You are King and Lord, Creator and Keeper of all. To you belong all glory and all praise. You are worthy of all our worship 
deserving of all our reverent fear and all of our love. You sent Jesus, your holy son, to live here among us, to show us your ways, to save us from our sins. As your word says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are to be feared. Most Holy Father, we thank you for giving us forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ. We thank you for providing the only sacrifice that could ever pay the price and cleanse our sinful souls by redeeming blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We call you Father, just as Jesus taught us to pray. This must mean that you call us your children, your sons and your daughters. Most Holy God, all our thanks and praise can never be sufficient to express to you proper honor for such a gift of grace and love. And Lord Jesus, through whom we pray, we have access into this amazing redeeming grace. Please wash us clean, we pray. Fill us with the Holy Spirit, we pray. Open our hearts to the joy of salvation and open our mouths to declare your name and your kingdom and your gospel to everyone we can, while we can, as long as we can, as far as we can. And as you taught us to pray, let us obey you in that commandment and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who gave his life to redeem us and give us forgiveness of sins and hope of eternal life, with you in glory. Amen. Who can forgive sins? This question is the centerpiece and point of this miracle in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's accounts. They've been inspired by the Holy Spirit to record it for us. Three witnesses. It's true. I almost want to walk you through this whole story, but I have a few other things to say about the application of the story and how little time. I'm going to walk you through it a little bit, okay? Just a little bit. These four men bringing their paralyzed friend. What did they see in Jesus? What did they see in him? I just want you to think about that. What did they see in Jesus that made him go there? And then when they saw the crowds, they couldn't get there. They couldn't get to him. Okay? Couldn't get in the door. Couldn't get around. What did they see in him that made them climb on that roof and tear a hole in that roof? And let their friend down in the middle of that room in front of Jesus. What did they see in him to make him do that? I mean, think of that. And what did Jesus see in them? What did he see in them? He saw their, he saw their faith. Faith will move you to tear down Buildings if you have to, to get to Jesus. Okay? It will move you to go places you wouldn't normally go. Do things you wouldn't normally... You see the crowd, oh, oh well, I guess we'll go back and catch him later. No. Faith will move you. Faith will get you there. When you're not getting there, it's because your faith may be weak. Just saying. Just quick application. Okay, back to the little notes here. If you could sum up in one word what has brought on every problem in humanity, what word would you choose? Ignorance? Poverty? Um, education? Government? What would you choose? What word would you choose to sum up all the problems of humanity? You know what it is, right? It's a three-letter word. It's sin. Sin. Sin is the huge problem. Why do you think that word sin is so unused today? You don't hear it outside of church much, do you? Unless you're with a Christian. 
In the days of Jesus, in His earthly ministry, this word sin, they knew it. And it was really common. And they knew its power and its problems. And they knew that only God could handle this. Only God could fix this. That's what they knew. There's a few Hebrew and Greek words which are translated sin in different translations. I looked it up. The word sin is found 1,016 times in the King James Version. In the English Standard Version, it's found 1,198 times. Why another 180-something times? And in, in today's Living Bible, it's found 1,648 times. I would expect sin to be less in the more modern translations, but it's more. And the reason is... It's also in just about every book of the Bible. But the reason is that the words for sin are variations on it. There's words like iniquity and transgression and sin and evil and disobedience and other words that can properly be translated sin so that they find their way into English by that word. And as Kendall shared last week in Genesis, we, we read that God created everything good, right? Right? He saw it was good. And after he made human beings, male and female, in his own image, in his own likeness, God saw everything he was made, and his word says in Genesis 131, it was very good. Very good. And then sin entered, says Romans. In just those words, two words, sin entered. By the end of Genesis 3, how are we doing in this world? Not good. What happened to the very good creation of God? The very good creation of God. Sin entered. The entire history of humanity in this world from that day forward has been a mixture and a battle between that which is good and that which is sin. That which is evil. Good and evil. Good and evil. And the struggle goes on. And sin has the death grip on every one of us. who are not in Christ. The wages of sin is what? It's death. You know it, don't you? You know the word. To f the further, listen, the further a culture moves away from this truth about sin, the worse it gets. When people come to know the true and living God, guess what happens? They discover the danger of sin and its grip. When people don't believe in sin, they don't believe in God either. Not the true and living God. They make up a God who fits whatever they want it to be. It's idolatry. Remember what God said to Abraham about Sodom back in the book of Genesis? God came to Abraham and he said, I'm going to tell Abraham what I'm about to do. The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so very grave, their sin so very grave, I will go down and see whether they've made a complete end if they just totally destroyed everything good according to the outcry that's come to me. And if not, I will know. Now Abraham heard those words of God. He may not have had the theological framework to parse it through in the details, but he knew one thing. God's about to judge those sinners and it's going to be bad for them. And he pled with God for them. We don't know if anybody went and warned the people of Sodom and Gomorrah of their sin. We don't know if Lot preached and spoke about it at all. We don't know. But we do know that their destruction was a punishment for their sins. Remember Jonah's commission? God said to him in the very second verse of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 2, he spoke to Jonah and said, Arise and go to Nineveh, of that great city and cry out against it, for their sin has come up before me. And Jonah, unlike Abraham, hoped that God would destroy Nineveh. He didn't like him at all. He didn't want to go there and declare God's judgment against their sins. He was afraid something might happen. What was he afraid of? That they would hurt him? No. He was afraid they might repent. And God would be merciful. What happened when Jonah finally went, when he finally came to Nineveh and he pronounced, 40 days and you're going to be burned up. What did Nineveh do 
when she heard about her sins and its punishment. They listened and believed in God and they believed in sin and they repented. Listen, if you believe in God and you don't believe in sin, you don't really believe in God. Okay? But if you believe in sin, you know you need help. If you really know what it is, you know you need help and God is the answer. God is the answer. Sin tends to call you into God's presence. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God and Mark records his message in chapter 1. Time, the time is fulfilled, said Jesus. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Those were Jesus' words when he came preaching. He talked about the kingdom of God and he talked about the good news of God's favor upon those who would believe, turn to him in faith. The first step of saving faith is to be convicted, though, of our sin so that we will repent of it. Before baptism for remission of sins, you have to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and repent. You must turn to God. I don't just believe in God and keep running with sin. I turn to, I turn to God and I turn away from sin. That's repentance. And I turn to the God who saves me through Jesus Christ. And I reach out to Him in confession. You are Lord. And I'm buried with Him in baptism. And I'm raised to walk in newness of life. And He grants me forgiveness of my sins. And He doesn't just wash me clean of sins. He comes and dwells in me by His Spirit. And He gives me a new name. A new purpose. A new life. Throughout history, wherever the gospel has taken root in people's lives, people have heard the story of God's grace in Christ and forgiveness of sins through His death on the cross, His blood shed there, and His glorious resurrection on the third day. Why? Why did Jesus come here? Think about our top concerns and priorities. What is your top concern? What's the biggest priority of your life? To fix the economy? To get the right political people in place? To, get the, to vote in the right people? To deal with all world hunger? Maybe that's a big one. To resolve all our health issues, this crazy t pandemic? To make life more comfortable? More prosperous? More full of pleasures and material success? What's your highest goal? Is it to get a career? Is that what you spend all your time and your money on? And your energies toward? Is it to build hospitals or open schools? Those are good things, aren't they? All those are good things in some sense. But let's get back to our text. What was the top priority of these four men who tore open that roof in the house so they could let down their paralyzed friend? What was their top priority? I'll tell you what it was. It was to get their friend healed. Okay? Jesus had a higher priority than that. I don't think those four guys who were carrying him up there and that paralyzed guy was hoping necessarily to get his sins forgiven. Maybe. Maybe I'm wrong on that. But I can imagine that wasn't the first thing on their minds. Maybe you disagree. My guess is that they wanted Jesus to heal him from his paralysis. But what their paralyzed friend got first was vastly more precious in God's economy. Right? That's why Jesus looked at him, he saw their faith, and he gave them the best gift he could give. Right? The best gift wasn't that he would walk, it's that he would be forgiven of his sins. It only took a word of Jesus to heal him from paralysis. What did it take for Jesus to pay for his sins? He took his blood, his body, his sacrifice. John the Baptist said it well. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus has authority on earth and this miracle points to one singular point and that is he has authority on earth to forgive sin. 
He purchased us with His own blood. The Jews of His day knew the truth that only God, only God can forgive sins. They just didn't know who was in the room with them. <laughs> and we need to learn how bad our sin is and how good our God is. And get those truths down so deep that they guide us in this life. The truth is, both have to be believed if we're going to be saved. When society forgets what sin is, they forget who they are. They forget what they are. And worse, they forget who God is. And listen to this, and listen carefully. All sin is against God. You say, I didn't sin against God, I sinned against my neighbor. No, you sinned against God. Okay? You've got to get that one. It might be against somebody else too. But it is foremost against God. David, King David recognized this with his, after his sin with Bathsheba, when he was finally confronted and came to his senses and was in repentant confession, he wrote Psalms 51 verses 1 through 10. And let me read this to you. These words of a penitent man who knows what sin is and knows who his sin is against and knows what his needs are. He said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. He wants to use all three words he can. I know my transgression. My sin is always before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Do you get it? So that you're justified when you judge. You're justified in your words. You're blameless in your judgments. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin my mother conceived me. How bad off is David? He said, I've been so bad ever since the beginning. He didn't think like this until after Bathsheba, by the way. I think he thought he was pretty good. God stripped all that pride away. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. You teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. I tell you, when you believe in Jesus Christ and you repent of your sins and you confess Jesus is Lord and you're baptized, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit into Jesus Christ's death and you're raised up like He was raised from that dead. He forgives your sins and after washing them away, He gives you a right spirit. A right spirit. The Holy Spirit. That's what Peter said in Acts 2, 38, right? Men and brethren, what should we do? We're guilty of killing the Son of God. They felt the guilt. They felt the sin. They saw the impact of the sin. They realized how bad off they were. And they're crying out for help. And Peter says, here's what you do. Repent, every one of you. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you. It's for your children. For all who are far off. As many as the Lord our God will call. You see, God, it wants to forgive. He's Jesus is dying to forgive you. Literally. Are we, what do we see in Him? What do we see in Jesus that makes us move toward Him or not? What do we see in Jesus? You see? What, is we, what do we see in Jesus? And maybe more importantly is this question. What does Jesus see in me? What happens when people don't believe in God? What happens when people don't believe in sin? What happens when it becomes posh and cool and hip to leave the word sin out of conversations and beliefs and simply try to live as if it doesn't exist? What happens? Paul writes it well. He said, sin reigns. Even over those or ignorant and don't know it. It's just, it just rules. And death rules through sin. It just does. 
That word sin oh, sounds so judgmental, doesn't it? Tell somebody you're a sinner. First thing you need to do is say, I'm a sinner. And you are too. <laughs> All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. All of us need to repent. Erasing the word and its notions from our thoughts and minds is not going to help us. It will only lead us deeper into darkness, deeper into confusion, further from blessings of God and more into his curses. But I'll tell you something. Those who believe in God, those who turn to his word and show as he shows us who he is, and he shows us who we are, and he shows us our sin as the problem, and he shows us Jesus Christ, our king, as our who died for our sins, who rose again as the deliverer and savior from our sins. And that he forgives the sins of all who trust and obey him. And that Jesus Christ is coming again and going to receive us to himself and bring us into glory with him forever. Have you been to Jesus to receive forgiveness of sins? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Jesus' words, the time is fulfilled. Enough time. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to sing a song of encouragement. If you're here today and you want to respond by just coming forward, we'll pray with you. If you want to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, come. Come. What are you waiting for? Come. He's calling. Come. While we're singing. Sometimes our here feeling in his heart. again. I have a few announcements uh, this morning before we dismiss. Greg, thank you for those words of encouragement. Uh, we often need to be reminded that we've been forgiven. And uh, it's not by anything we've done, but it's what he's done for us and everything that he's actually done for us. If you're visiting with us again, thank you for being with us this morning. We're grateful to have all of our visitors you have been an encouragement to this church body right here just visiting with us thank you for your presence uh good to see patrick and emily here this morning we're glad to have you with us uh several announcements here uh wednesday november the 17th 
will be our next opportunity to prepare and to serve meals for families on the mountain. If you wish to help, please see Margo. Uh, Parents Night Out, uh, November the 19th from 5.30 to 8.30. Any questions, please uh, see April Sutterfield about that. Uh, the Christmas party uh, will be Saturday, December the 4th. If you want to mark that on your calendar, that's uh, Saturday the 4th. Uh, there will be an elders deacons meeting on Saturday, December the 5th at 3 p.m. So please, uh, all your deacons, if uh, you would notate that. Uh, everyone 60 or older is invited to Judy and Bob Mays' home for a Christmas brunch. That will be Saturday, December the 11th. That will be 9.30 a.m. So those of you who are in that age group, uh, you are welcome to be there. Uh, any other announcements that I may have missed that need to be announced at this time? Have a few birthday announcements I want to speak of. Uh, uh, for this coming week, Angie Stewart, uh, Roberto Rios, Bill Hill. You going to make it to 60, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, and Asher and Benjamin Stewart will have birthdays this coming week. So remember, the Stewart's going to have a big birthday week, so that's great. Uh, also remember this week, uh, and continue to remember in your prayers, Margot, for the loss of her brother. And, uh, that's and also remember Jan Thomas. Jan has had a couple of falls here recently and sort of bummed herself up a little bit. So... Remember Jan in your prayers and, uh, and Coy. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Yes. C Comer, Donna Comer. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, what a privilege and what a blessing it has been together here this morning, Lord, to worship you, to acknowledge that you are God and you are our Redeemer. I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, as we've gathered here, that our time of worship and our song service has all been to honor your name. And I pray, Heavenly Father, it has been an encouragement for all of those who have been with us and for our membership here. I pray, Lord, that you will bless each person who has gathered here and that you'll watch over them and be with them this coming week. Father, we pray for those who, uh, uh, especially for Margot, who has lost her brother, and uh, we pray for her to be comforted in this time by the, by the church here, and uh, pray your blessings be upon her. Pray for our sister Jan, who's gone through some falls this past week, a couple of weeks, and we pray, Lord, your blessings be upon her and Coy, and uh, we're mindful of Donna Comer, good friend of uh, Marie. We pray, Lord, that you'll continue to watch over and bless her in her time of illness. Father, be with each of us as we go through this coming week. And Father, may we be your remnant. May we each serve you and others faithfully. For you, Heavenly Father, have forgiven us. You have cleansed us and you have redeemed us from our sins. And we're so thankful for that. Father, watch over us. Keep each one safe. It's our prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen.